Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities, supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Hi, welcome. My name is Laura Gow, and as the Program Manager of the Exploring for the Future program, I have the great privilege of moderating this, the very last session of the last ever Exploring for the Future showcase. What a program. I'm sorry, what a journey. Before we start the final session on groundwater systems of the Kernamona and Upper Darling Barker River, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have lived and shared culture in the Canberra region for many thousands of years. I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to recognise the regional studies we will hear about in this session were conducted on Barkindji, Andamutna, Naduri, Wilya Kali, Marlon Gampa, Gumaru Niampa Nation Country. Finally, I extend a welcome to all First Nations Australians joining. To recap on today's earlier sessions, in case you missed anything, we've heard about regional studies focused on minerals in the Delamarian origin, minerals and energy in and around the Birundudu Basin, and groundwater in the Musgraves and South Nicholson and Georgina Basins. As with all our past sessions, if you've missed anything, you can catch up by going to the showcase webpage and following the links to the recordings and publications. Our collaborative partners are many, as you can see on the slide. We thank you for your contributions and for your support. It's been wonderful working with you over the years. Now on to our last session. We will continue our focus on groundwater projects from the previous session, starting with two presentations on our work in the Upper Darling Barker floodplain, focusing on the understanding on understanding the groundwater system and investigating the potential for managed aquifer recharge. Then we'll wrap up with a mineral exploration flavour in the Kernamona region. You'll then have the chance to ask our speakers questions. Remember to pop these in the Q&A stream at the top of your screen as we go. Then we'll hear a wrap up of the showcase and some teasers about what's in store for the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative, the new 35 year pre competitive geoscience program led by Geoscience Australia that commenced in July this year. So, to our first speaker, then, Dr. Sarah Buckerfield, who will present on groundwater systems of the Upper Darling Barker floodplain and integrated assessment. Prior to working on the Upper Darling Barker River floodplain groundwater study, Sarah completed her PhD on groundwater contamination in southwest China. Sarah has worked primarily in the groundwater and geophysics teams at Geoscience Australia, as well as any other field work she can manage to convince her manager to agree to. Thank you, Sarah.
the distribution of the aquifers in the floodplain, in particular the, the freshwater aquifer and um, the saline aquifers that predominant, predominate through most of the floodplain sequence. Uh, my colleague KP is going to give a presentation after this one, going into more detail on the potential use of one of those low salinity zones um, for town water supply and improving water security.
the river provides a key recharge uh, to the alluvial system. Um, we know that and we know river flows have declined by 50 to 75 per cent. It's really important to assess what impact that's having on groundwater systems. Um, so our analysis of trends in groundwater levels shows that uh, the majority of aquifers show decline in average water levels. Um, so you can see that uh, through the colour of the bores on this map. Um, so the pink and the red colours um, are showing decline in water levels. There's a couple of exceptions. We've seen increases in water levels around irrigation districts. So the nature of that decline is, is more nuanced than a simple linear um, decline over time. Uh, we're dealing with an episodic system. Um, in reality, the frequency of recharge events is declining uh, and flows in particular flow bands are declining. Um, so we need further work to uh, assess the significance of different flow bands for groundwater system recharge um, and the ecosystems in different parts of the floodplain. On that note, uh, we did a groundwater dependent ecosystem component for this project, um, which I presented on um, in a previous showcase. Um, so we tested and calibrated several publicly available remote sensing data sets uh, to better map the known groundwater dependent vegetation communities. Um, we worked with some ecologists from uh, New South Wales DQ to constrain um, what we were seeing in the remote sensing data sets to vegetation communities on the ground. And um, the next step in this work will be to understand um, what the water requirements are of these communities. Um, and that type of work is being done currently in different parts of Australia. Um, and in this part of the world, what the declining recharge the groundwater system may, may mean for those ecosystems. In conclusion, um, we've been able to map um, with, with high confidence the distribution of um, saline and uh, freshwater aquifers in this um, alluvial system in the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, we've been able to constrain the key um, geological and um, process controls on their occurrence. We've also um, demonstrated uh, through this project the utility of the AEM and SMR data sets um, in particular, which um, would be very applicable to um, other Cenozoic aquifer systems in Australia. Um, and we've demonstrated the application of uncertainty uh, in geophysics in these data sets as well. And then with the GDE work, we've been able to contribute to the toolbox of remote sensing um, tools available for mapping of GDEs. So we've got a series of publications. If you'd like more information on any of these aspects, or please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with us. Um, and we would like to really thank our collaborative partners without which um, this work would, would definitely not have uh, been realised. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Sarah. This work is a great demonstration of how much insight can be gained into groundwater systems through geophysics and existing bore information. It's remarkable that in the Murray-Darling Basin, one of the best studies waterways in Australia, we're learning about previously unknown, potentially fresh pockets of groundwater. It highlights just how much more there is to learn about Australia's precious groundwater resources. Now I'll hand to Dr. Kokpiang Tan, who will present some related some related work on potential for a managed aquifer recharge system, sorry, scheme in the Upper Darling Barker floodplain, Wilcannia region. KP is a geologist and has extensive experience applying airborne ge electromagnetics and ground-based geophysics ge geophysical techniques to map and characterise geological formations and aquifers, establish potential groundwater resources and identify salinity hazards in sedimentary basins. KP obtained his PhD at the ANU in 2021. Thank you, KP. On behalf of the co-authors, I would like to present a preliminary assessment of the managed aquifer recharge potential in the Wilcannia region. And this project is part of the Upper Darling Barker River floodplain project uh, in northwest New South Wales in collaboration with the New South Wales Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. The aims of the Upper Darling Barker River floodplain project are to improve groundwater system understanding, assessing groundwater surface water connectivity, and investigate the potential of ma managed aquifer recharge options to enhance drought resilience. The scope of this presentation are to examine the hydrogeology of the potential MAR target areas in the Wilcannia region, as shown as a blue ellipsoid on the map, and to provide a preliminary assessment of a MAR target that is suitable for a pilot study. The Wilcannia region is heavily reliant on surface water and this results in inadequate water security during drought, affecting economic prospects, community welfare and the environment. 
The forecasts of water needs are 483 megalitres per year by 2046. The histogram in the top figure shows the number of days without any flow in the river per year. During the drought events since 2000, there are 11 years when there was no flow in the river for more than 100 days per year. A replacement weir has been planned for added water security and emergency town water supply boards at Union Bend provide portable source of water. However, the quality of groundwater deteriorates with prolonged extraction. Supplementary groundwater source and scheme such as managed aquifer recharge can provide additional security during drought. Next, we look at the principles of managed aquifer recharge. During high river flow, we extract the required amount of water from the river and store this water in a suitable aquifer to recover in the future, such as under low river conditions or drought for municipal and environmental purposes. The sequential managed aquifer recharge technology, or SMART, is developed in Germany and this technology can be adopted to the Wilcania region. SMART includes the use of riverbank and aquifer sediments to filter the river water. Riverbank filtration technique allows oxidation of organic matter in the unconfined aquifer prior to injection of this filtered water into the storage aquifer. This prevents clogging of the pores in the storage aquifer. Airborne electromagnetic data was acquired as part of this project and the flight spacings ranges from 250 meters and 1 kilometer around Wilcania to 5 kilometers at the edge of the floodplain. The Geophysics Acquisition Program team here at GA has developed the deterministic inversion model, HiQGA, and this model is used to interpret the geological setting. Probabilistic inversion model has since been developed by the team and will be used in the follow-up work. Previous results from Broken Hill Managed Aquifer Recharge Project shows that a conductivity threshold of less than 0.06 Siemens per meter can be used to demarcate acceptable quality water, which has less than 1,200 milligrams per liter TDS held within the Cenozoic Sediments Aquifer. Using this threshold, the AEM conductivity grid at 40 meter depth shows the presence of four areas where groundwater is possibly of acceptable quality. These areas are surrounded by conductive region, shown as warm colours on a map, indicative of sediments with brackish to saline water. The resistive areas around the edge of the floodplain, uh, shown in blue and green, are Paleozoic, bedrock and saprolite. As part of this project, we have also acquired three sets of borehole geophysical locks. These are, from left to right of the image, induction conductivity, natural gamma, and nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR. Natural gamma is used to interpret the lithology. Low gamma values denote the presence of sand, whereas high gamma values indicate the presence of silt and clay layers. NMR shows the mobile water content, uh, shown as blue line, and the total water content, uh, shown as red line, and are equivalent to effective and total porosity of the sediment respectively. Using both gamma and NMR locks, we can determine the presence of aquifer and aquitards. And we use all three sets of data to interpret the stratigraphy based on the stratigraphic framework of the Murray Darling Basin. On the right are surface magnetic resonance, SMR, water content profiles modeled to a depth of 90 meters. A GA probabilistic inversion model was used, showing the credible range of water contents from 5th percentile to 95th percentile. The solid black line represents the median value. SMR water contents help us to interpret the presence or absence of aquifers and their depth range. There are four main aquifers present beneath the Darling Barca River floodplain and ranges in age from the Miocene to Holocene. The unconfined aquifers are the Kunabigo and Menindi formations. These formations consist of several meters thick of clay drape at the top and a few meters of sand rich aquifer at the base. The semi confined aquifer is the Pliocene Calibre formation, comprising intubated sand and silt sequence, commonly with a clay layer at the top of the sequence. The Miocene Randmark group is present within the Paleo Valley of the study area 
comprising of intubated sand and silt sequence. The table on the right summarizes the hydraulic conductivity and transmissivity of the four aquifers derived from the NMR data and supported by pump test results on the emergency town water supply bores. The Calibre Formation and the Remark Group have higher hydraulic conductivity and transmissivity and are suitable candidates for Ma. However, as will be shown later, the Remark Group contains saline groundwater and is not the preferred storage aquifer. We integrate the hydrostratigraphy with the water levels and hydrochemistry from wells to better understand the surface water groundwater connectivity. Fluctuation of standing water level is dependent on the distance to the river. Strongest response is from the unconfined aquifer, um, shown here in blue, that is within 100 meters from the river. Standing water level of bores that are greater than 500 meters away from the river shows subdued response. Standing water levels of the deeper aquifers are slightly higher than the shallower aquifer following density correction. This suggests that the standing water level are potential metric surface or pressure response under semi-confined to confined conditions. The AEM conductivity model on the left and the groundwater chemistry shows that the low conductivity zone in blue denoting the semi-confined aquifer contains acceptable quality water of less than 800 mg per litre TDS. Percent modern carbon, PMC and tritium values suggest water in the semi-confined aquifer is in the orders of 1,000 years old. This suggests that episodic recharge during high river levels to the semi-confined aquifer may take hundreds of years. Water from the Randmark group is at depth is shown to be saline at more than 20,000 mg per litre TDS. Here we take a closer look on two of the potential MA targets closest to Will Kenya. Areas with acceptable quality water is preferred for MA because the quality of injected water can remain as acceptable after mixing with the in-situ groundwater. Injection of water increases the hydraulic pressure around the well and pushes the in-situ groundwater outwards. The volume of injected water that displaces the in-situ groundwater is termed as additional storage capacity. The movement of in-situ water away from the well in turn pushes the saline water further out, thus forming a buffer zone between the injected water and the saline groundwater. This reduces the chance of saline groundwater reaching the well during water extraction and improves the recovery efficiency. The recovery efficiency refers to the volume of acceptable quality water recoverable as a percentage of the volume of water recharged. Both the additional storage capacity and recovery efficiency can only be quantified from a trial aquifer and storage recover test. Note that the uh, traverses AA prime and BB prime, which will be shown in the following slide as we examine these MAR targets in further details. Interpretation of the AEM model sections shows that the MAR targets 1 and 2 have different geological settings. At target 1, the Paleo Valley is bounded by shallow bedrock subcrops, whereas at target 2, the Paleozoic bedrock is deeper and the Redmark group sediments, which appears as warm colours, overlies the bedrock. The SMR water contents profiles and the water peaks depths shows the presence of unconfined and semi-confined aquifers. The gamma locks on the eastern part of target 2 indicates that the presence of intubated sand and silt sequence. The AEM conductivity interpretation suggests that the semi-confined aquifers extends beyond the MAR targets. Next, we'll look at some key parameters of the four MAR targets. Based on the borehole NMR data, the Calibre Formation Aquifer at 50th percentile effective porosity has pore volumes of 77 gigalitres to 256 gigalitres. It is very likely that there is additional storage capacity at each target to store the required amount of injected water. The source of water is from the Darling Baka River, which flowed across every MAR target. The maximum distance from the edge of target to the river is less than 2 kilometres. This is important for identifying areas suitable for bank filtration and the injection wells, which need to be placed some distance from the river to minimize any impact to the unconfined aquifer. The average distances of the MAR targets to the emergency town water supply bores ranges from 4 kilometers to more than 20 kilometers. 
Based on the standing water level response to fluctuation in river level shown earlier, the potential impact of a mass scheme on this emergency bore water wells is expected to be low. Overall, Target 1 is the closest to Wilkenia and this is the most suited area to conduct a pilot study with fewer logistical concerns. Here we have conducted a preliminary assessment on MAR Target 1 for a small-scale pilot study. The aquifer storage and recovery wells are best located on elevated terraces that are less prone to flooding. Another requirement is to identify areas with acceptable quality groundwater close to the river, suitable for installation of riverbank filtration wells. The image on the right shows the AEM conductivity at shallow depths of around 14 meters, which represents the conductivity of the unconfined aquifer. Areas with acceptable quality water appears as low conductivity or in blue, and three areas labeled as A, B, and C are identified as suitable riverbank filtration sites. The figure on the left shows the maximum extent of acceptable quality water at around 40 meter depth in the semi-confined aquifer. Sites A, B, and C, which are preferred for riverbank filtration wells, are also suited suitable for aquifer storage and recovery wells. The image on the right shows the AEM conductivity grid between 70 to 76 meter depths. The resistive areas surrounding sites A and B are bedrock subcrops, whereas Renmark Group is present at site C. Extraction of water from sites A and B may have a lower risk of saline groundwater ingress from the Renmark Group compared to site C. As part of the pilot study, Monitoring bores are required to be installed to detect any change in water quality and standing water levels of all the three aquifers. In conclusions, we have demonstrated the use of AEM ground-based geophysical techniques in demarcating areas with acceptable quality water potentially suitable for MA. Hydrogeological characteristics such as storage capacity and recovery efficiency need to be established with a pilot study. An area suitable for MAR pilot study has been identified. The geophysical techniques applied to the Darling Barka River floodplain region are applicable to the other Cenozoic alluvial systems in Australia, such as the Murray Darling Basin. We would like to thank our collaboration partners, DQ, Water New South Wales, and CSRO, in supporting our work. Finally, here is a list of product documents for public access and the related datasets and databases for the users. Thank you. Thanks KP. It's great to see an example of how the conceptual and architectural information Sarah presented can be built on to assess opportunities for managed aquifer recharge in the Wilcannia region. To round out our three technical talks, we'll hear from Ravan Schroeder on aquifer alchemy, decoding mineral clues in the Kernamona region. Ivan is a senior geochemist in the regional geology and drilling team. He joined Geoscience Australia 12 years ago and began working in greenhouse gas monitoring technologies. In recent years, he has focused on groundwater geochemistry to characterise groundwater baselines and identify new approaches for detecting and assessing subsurface mineral prospectivity. Thank you, Van. Sarah and KP gave a great overview of the range of data sets and approaches we can apply to hydrogeological problems. I'm diving deep into one aspect of this, looking at the chemistry of groundwater in the neighbouring Kernamona region, and in particular, looking at how we can use groundwater chemistry to detect mineralisation. Now, this is work I'll be presenting uh, on behalf of my co-authors and collaborators, uh, which has been led by Nathan Reed at CSIRO, and with support from the Minex CRC and the State Geological Surveys. Before I continue, I want to express my thanks and acknowledgement to my colleagues for their many contributions and efforts to this study. As I'll demonstrate in this talk, I'll be using groundwater across the Kernamona region for a fresh look at detecting mineralisation, using 297 high quality groundwater samples, including new samples collected as part of this work which are highlighted in red. And to clear things up for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about the Kernamona region quite often, and this is given we have several overlapping provinces and basins that are all relevant for the groundwater systems, unless I'm specifically referring to the um, basement Kernamona province geology. Now, why are we interested in the Kernamona region? From a minerals perspective, uh, the big draw is its world-class Z-Link Silver Endowment. 
but we've got the Broken Hill Mine and associated deposits along the line of load, which have been in operation since 1885. But the region also hosts multiple other commodities, uh, including gold, um, copper cobalt, copper moly systems, uranium, and iron ore. However, as we can see from this map, uh, a lot of the known deposits are dominantly in our outcropping regions in the darker colours, despite the basement geology continuing undercover. So, there's a real opportunity and drive to try and extend the exploration search space for this region into our covered terrain. But why should we use groundwater to explore? Fundamentally, groundwater gives us a view into the geology under the surface. Groundwater chemistry reflects the host rock lithology and mineralogy. As groundwater is flowing through an aquifer, it dissolves some of the minerals um, and progressively changes the groundwater chemistry over time and downflow. And in some way, this process makes groundwater superior to rock samples for a regional prospectivity program, as each groundwater sample is averaging the geochemical signal from a geology of a much wider area upflow, rather than a specific point in place, as per a rock sample. Groundwater has multiple other things going for it, uh, compared with traditional exploration techniques. It's relatively low cost and non-destructive, and added, has the added advantage that in arid and semi-arid areas, like in the Kernamona region, groundwater bores are distributed throughout. So we can often get a more uh, representative distribution of samples where we might be lacking otherwise geological constraints. But most importantly, groundwater-based exploration works, with multiple case studies globally and in Australia of groundwater being used to detect mineralization of different styles and at different scales. Here is an example of using regional groundwater in the northern Yilgarn to detect gold mineralisation. Anomalies in a gold geochemical index were found to align both with the prospective greenstone belts and known gold deposits in the region, as well as flagging uh, new anomalies uh, worthy of follow-up. But finally, and crucially, we're revisiting this area because previous work in the Kernamona region has already demonstrated potential of the groundwater to detect mineralisation giving us a high quality regional data set to build off. 275 samples were collected across the region during the early 2000s as part of CRC LEAM to test the application of groundwater as an exploration tool. This is a data set we've re-released in its entirety to make it more accessible. I won't dive too heavily into those earlier results other than to share their findings about the power of isotopes that is sulfur, lead and strontium to discriminate mineralization or prospective geology from background processes. This previous work raised many groundwater geochemical anomalies uh, attributed to potential mineralization. However, with the emerging nature of groundwater as an exploration tool at this time, this meant we didn't really see the follow-up investigation or exploration to really test or build on these anomalies in the intervening years. So, we saw a real opportunity to revisit this work, and in that vein, 24 new samples were collected, targeting spatial gaps from the earlier study, especially in the covered region, as well as following up some of those prospective anomalies um, that they'd highlighted. So, as an alignment of both the structure for the remainder of this talk and the key objectives of this new study, I'll first present a culmination of our reassessment of groundwater chemistry anomalies in the region using traditional multi-element approaches that have continued to be developed over the last 20 years. And then I'm going to provide a proof of concept for how we can approach the search for groundwater anomalies differently to get better results with more discrimination and more sensitivity, leading to less false positives in our exploration program. Diving into these results using that traditional multi-element approach, um, the maps I'm going to flick through here are identifying outliers and pathfinder elements associated with various mineral systems. Uh, and these outliers are defined using Australia-wide thresholds in groundwater chemistry. I'm not going to focus on any of the maps in isolation, but instead we'll talk about all the anomalies together. But first up, we have a map of our lead zinc silver um, systems, then our copper-related systems, gold-related systems, and then our last one looking at sulfur-related systems. Now, even just flicking through this, you may have noticed that not every outlier on the map has then been circled as an anomaly. And this is because the interpretation of groundwater chemistry is not always straightforward. Particularly, elemental highs that are the bread and butter of rock or soil uh, geochemistry exploration campaigns can be misleading in groundwater. This is because elements may just be higher in the groundwater due to evaporating more during recharge. 
or other hydrogeological processes. Thus, one hotspot by itself is not a reliable indicator of any potential mineralization. But if it's supported by multiple nearby samples or multiple lines of geochemical evidence, it becomes more robust. Now, here are the results all put together with some of the mines and deposits highlighted. I'll spend some time on this figure to talk about the anomalies and what they mean. First up, we have two anomalies on either side of our Broken Hill line of load um, that showed very strong multi-element signatures of Broken Hill type mineralization. Given a groundwater flow, it's unlikely that uh, both of these anomalies could be related to this line of load, which suggests that at least one of these clusters may be capturing unknown mineralization. Another anomaly we're interested in is just north of the Thakaringa deposit. Um, this one's of interest because Thakaringa, being a lead zinc silver system, yet the anomaly we're seeing here has indicator elements much more reflective of copper related system, which might mean we have a different mineralization style in the area. Also, a feature of um, interest is this anomaly to the north, uh, which is a very high gold anomaly, uh, reaching 43 nanograms per litre, which is roughly 20 times typical background uh, groundwater levels. And this is supported by coincident arsenic, as well as a nearby sulphur anomaly. We also see anomalies in the South Australian Ellery Ranges in parameters that are largely related to copper-related uh, systems. The one furthest to the left uh, is near to the Billaroo deposit, but the others are not near any known deposits. Additionally, we have two cobalt nickel anomalies uh, that are far away from areas of outcrop and known mineralization. These locations are of particular interest for potentially detecting unknown basement mineralization through cover and are worthy of follow-up investigation. Now, taking these anomalies as a whole, the main point that we see is that we've both got anomalies that are likely relating to known mineralization in the area, which is good for validating that these uh, tools and indicator elements are working, but we're also flagging multiple anomalies without known deposits in the region. Now, this approach um, and multi-element assessment is purely based on geochemical patterns. But what if we can gain more insight, more sensitivity, and more targeted anomalies by considering the groundwater systems that the samples come from. This will be the focus of the case study for the remainder of my talk. Now, understanding each sample's hydrostratigraphy is important because the power of groundwater chemistry is amplified when we're sampling directly from the aquifer that's hosting mineralization. It's also important because we want to make sure we're comparing like with like to avoid false positives. For example, a jump in copper between two adjacent samples could be mineralization, or it could be a change in aquifer composition to something of a more volcanic uh, nature. Additionally, incorporating the hydrogeological context is even more important due to the complex hydrostratigraphy we see in this region. We've got a range of different local and regional aquifers, as well as a d whole suite of lithologies that really increase the risk that we could be trying to compare unrelated samples. Now, I'll run through the main groundwater systems briefly, as this will support the case study to follow. First up, um, we've got our basement Kernamona province, which has fractured rock aquifers. And this is one of our key hydrostratigraphies for hosting much of the mineralization in this area. Then, we've also got fractured rock aquifers of the Adelaidean Super Basin in the Delamarian origin on the Kernamona province margins. We've got the Paleozoic Darling Basin, as well as the Arawi Basin, though we can ignore that one because it's going to be too deep for any of our groundwater. We've also got the Aramanga Basin to the north, the Murray Basin to the south, and the Lake Eyre Basin, which has several different regional and Paleo Valley aquifers uh, draping over the top. Now, to start to unpack this hydrogeological complexity for our groundwater data set, we first need to classify the hydrostratigraphy for each of our samples. But this isn't necessarily straightforward. Groundwater bores often have poor logs and scant geological information to reasonably ID an aquifer. Add to that that in many cases we have stacked aquifers, uh, so we don't necessarily know which unit or units the bore might be screened in. And even where we have basement outcropping, we may know the hydrostratigraphy, but not necessarily the lithology of the aquifer we're sampling. Thus, as part of our case study, we developed a semi-objective clustering approach to attribute this hydrostratigraphy, which is both faster than a manual attribution process, and in complex terrains like this, is more reliable. Now, 
in this case, we used hierarchical clustering, uh, which looks to group samples based on their geochemical commonalities into larger and larger groups as we go up the tree. We then apply a statistical test to identify the best point to stop as a trade-off between the number of clusters and the closeness of groups, and this is shown by a dashed line. Now, we took a variety of steps uh, to avoid spurious results and ensure that a robust quality assurance and quality control process um, was undertaken, and the full detail of all of this is outlined in one of our products. Now, the important feature I want to draw attention to, though, is this approach in these clusters were generated only using these major and minor elements. And this means uh, that features like latitude, longitude, depth, field measurements such as conductivity, temperature, redox, as well as our isotopes, are a key independent tool for validating that these clusters are capturing real groundwater relationships and not just noise as well as providing strong evidence to be able to split one of our clusters based on two spatially distinct subpopulations, which is shown in the red line. Now, going from these clusters, they were generated purely from geochemical relationships, and there is the risk that this may overfit or simplify some of our sample classification. Thus, the clusters did need to be interpreted uh, with respect to their hydrostratigraphic context, and this yielded nine baseline aquifer subgroups, which we have a high hydrostratigraphic confidence in, as well as an unclassified group covering, uh, containing all the remaining samples from each cluster, where we had a bit lower confidence. And here is their distribution across the region. Now, for this case study, uh, I'll be looking at sulfide systems. So the subgroups we're most interested in are the basement, uh, which are shown with the three shades of purple. These are fractured rock aquifers of the Kernamona province and Adelaidean superbasin. As expected, they are distributed dominantly near our areas of outcrop, but interestingly, we do see several samples of basement character coming through beneath the Mundi Plains. The other subgroup we're interested in for the study is the Lake Air Basin subgroups in orange. Uh, although not hosting sulfides themselves, this basin is often directly and shallowly overlying basement, and we'd be interested to see if any anomalies are, can come through that suggest mis mixing and contact with mineralization in the underlying basement. And lastly, we do consider the unclassified group for anomalies as well. And this is to avoid discounting any samples that may have been so geochemically altered by nearby mineralization to misappropriate classification. In this case study, we apply a combination of sulfur isotopes and elevated copper or zinc concentrations as a sulfide detection tool. And this is based on the fact that uh, broken hilltite ore has a sulfur composition that is much lighter than the background uh, sulfur we'd see in groundwater, which predominantly comes uh, from meteoric sulfate as an aerosol. Thus, mineralized sulfides that are dissolved or oxidized by groundwater will both lower the groundwater's sulfur isotope value, as well as increasing the concentration of trace metals. So here I'll demonstrate how we can apply these criteria to the subgroups to enable detection of more sensitive outliers. First, we start by looking uh, for outliers in metal concentration. And here we have tukey box plots of copper and zinc normalized by conductivity to avoid evaporative enrichment effects. On these plots, the gray on the left is the full data set uh, distribution. And then our remaining 10 um, box plots are all those subgroups and the unclassified samples that I showed earlier on the map. Statistical outliers um, are the samples shown with the triangles and circles. So using our subgroups, most of the subgroups we can see have a much narrower geochemical range than the overall population. Our increased sensitivity comes about as there are several samples in the subgroups that are uh, demonstrating outliers and concentrations much lower than the thresholds in our um, total data population. For example, uh, on the graph on the right, we've got several of our um, basement outliers in zinc uh, that we're now able to resolve. And on the left, we've got also these lake air uh, basin copper and, uh, outliers that would otherwise be hidden within this uh, larger population distribution. Um, this means we're able to get outliers of much lower concentrations but we're also able to avoid some higher values in subgroups which may have naturally higher trace element uh, compositions and thus aren't actually truly outliers within that aquifer system. For example, our basement three, which has a much wider copper distribution. Now, to those outliers, uh, metal outliers identified in the previous slide, 
We then apply a filter for a low uh, sulfur isotope composition, in this case uh, for below 12 parts per thousand, and produce the following map, with the stars being uh, features of interest that have both low sulfur isotopes and elevated trace metals. Uh, with our characterization of the hydrostratigraphy, we can exclude the Darling Basin outlier, uh, as this is, basin is not known to host sulfide mineralization. We can also put less emphasis on the anomalies far to the west, as these are likely within the Neoproterozoic rather than the Kernamona province rocks. And the Neoproterozoic can uh, host sedimentary sulfides, which have a different isotopic character, and thus this may not represent a broken hill type mineralization. But excitingly, we do see clear indications of sulfide mineralization in the Broken Hill domain. Uh, with hotspots near Thakaringa, which if you recall also uh, demonstrate multi-element anomalies, um, as well as uh, this northern part of the uh, Broken Hill domain popping up again as having the right features for mineralization. In addition, we get targeted anomalies in the Aleri ranges, which may be indicative of Broken Hill type mineralization, or IOC min mineralization, which also contains a light sulfur isotope signature. Now, this approach of using baselines reduces our rate of false positives, which is a common risk in groundwater-based uh, exploration due to the geochemical complexity we're dealing with. In addition, it's been able to give us clear anomaly targets to follow up, as well as the hydrostratigraphic context to interpret them. And this is just one narrow application of using baselines towards mineral exploration. But there's so much opportunity to use this workflow and baselines for different commodities, pathfinder elements, and isotopes within this region. Now, what can we take away from this groundwater study? I've demonstrated um, using traditional multi-element approaches that we've found multiple new geochemical anomalies in groundwater that relate to multiple different styles of mineralization. Many of these targets do reside in our outcropping regions, uh, though we do have some evidence for mineralization undercover with our cobalt and nickel anomalies. Um, but the important feature, even with these ones in outcrop, is many of these anomalies are not near known mineralization, which gives us many exciting targets to follow up. I've also walked through a proof of concept case study of how we can apply geochemical baselines and hydrostratigraphy to define more sensitive and more targeted geochemical anomalies. This is a method with untapped potential, both to investigate further mineral prospectivity in this region and to be applied elsewhere in Australia. And I haven't even touched on how we could use these baselines for non-mineral systems purposes to gain more insights into hydrogeological processes, potentially characterize environmental baselines, and support better aquifer attribution of groundwater samples. So this study presents multiple avenues for exploration, as well as the opportunity to grow this methodology into the future. Thank you for your time and I invite you to check out the products and data sets that support this work and welcome any further questions that you may have. Thanks, Ivan. I think you've shown quite nicely that not only is groundwater a valuable resource in of itself, but it can also point the way to buried mineral resources in areas that might have otherwise been discounted. This brings us now to the Q&A session with our three speakers. If you haven't done so already, please add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask. Just a reminder that each of our speakers is presenting on behalf of a larger team. If, you ca if they can't answer your question, they'll be happy to take it on notice at our email, eftf.ga.gov.au. While your questions come in, I have one for all of our speakers, but I'll go to you first, Sarah. What are some of the fundamental data or knowledge gaps that still exist following these groundwater studies? What is your wish list of additional data over the area? Oh, well, <laughs> scientists always want more data. Um, so I, there are a number of, uh, I'd say, critical knowledge gaps and, and data, data gaps um, that, that still remain um, depends what the, the scale of the question you're looking at is, but um, at, I guess, the, the regional scale of the groundwater systems, um, we really do need uh, better conceptualisation and constraint on the um, process of surface groundwater connectivity, groundwater recharge, um, and also um, the contribution of, of groundwater base flow to the river. Um, so we have got, um, under climate change, a, largely drying um, trend across the Murray-Darling Basin mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, already causing declines in, in groundwater levels um, and understanding what that means for 
um, the contribution of the groundwater system to, to river discharge, for example, um, will require uh, good um, process uh, conceptualisation. Um, so for that we need um, more monitoring bores um, and we mm -hmm. could use uh, the AEM data that we've collected, for example, and been able to identify really key areas where the groundwater and the surface water systems interact to install um, the infrastructure that's needed, so monitoring bores and, and some more surface water gauges would be really good. Um, hydrochemistry sampling um, is a really good trace of groundwater discharge and it'd be really helpful to have that data. Um, so we use things like radon um, to trace groundwater discharge into rivers and, and quantify the input under different flow regimes. Um, on the recharge front, it would be um, the, uh, there's some uncertainties in um, particularly how the changing in rainfall and the, the headwater catchments is going to um, impact the, the floodplain recharge lower down the system in the Murray Darling, um, such as this catchment. Um, so we, we need to better quantify that and I think we could do a bit more with um, the, the time series data we've got from Digital Earth Australia looking mm -hmm. at inundation <coughs> in the floodplain and combining that with um, groundwater time series and, and surface water time series. Um, what else on the, the wish list? Um, I'll let KP talk a bit maybe about um, what, what we'd like to do with drilling and, and more aquifer testing um, for the you know, specific resource um, assessment and, and, um, and use and quantification. Um, but uh, another one would be GDEs, um, so mm -hmm. uh, Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems, yeah, so for the acronyms. Um, more, more widely uh, across the Murray-Darling Basin, we've got um, sort of 30% is classified as terrestrial GDEs um, and we need more data to constrain um, what their limits are um, so they, they can survive for periods but you know in between flood inundation events but um, we need better um, constraint on, on their limits um, in order to understand what we need for environmental watering and um, also to that end we need better characterization of the GDEs and understanding their value. Um, yeah so I know Tanya Duty and, and others at CSIRO have done a lot of work there um, on that on that front, but we, we do need quite a bit more yep. um, to manage resources going forward into a drier climate. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. I could keep talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> quite a wish list. KP, did you want to add? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, a good set of um, borehole um, information would be good, mm -hmm. um, especially like right now we are using the our knowledge from the previous uh, Broken Hill Managed Aquifer mm -hmm. Recharge. Um, to say that okay, this particular threshold um, is going to uh, give us a high probability of um, good quality water. So it will be good to have one borehole um, in each one of the MAR target areas so that we can validate um, this claim. Um, and also, um, uh, hopefully, uh, well, we wish that it will be um, coring technique, um, um, for example, sonic coring, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. give us a much better um, cause uh, for doing. Um, you know, grain size analysis, um, per meter test on the aquitards, and also the um, uh, test on the um, on the hydraulic conductivity of the sand sequence, and using all this um, sand uh, undisturbed um, sand representative sand aquifers uh, to do um, column experiments uh, to find out what's the potential of um, clogging uh, when we feed the um, the river water injectable river water uh, into the sediments. Mm -hmm. Um, and another wish list would be right now is is doable because the um, our colleagues have um, already come up with the uh, probabilistic inversion of the A year, mm -hmm. so we'll use this um, methods to look over again um, the resistive areas uh, within the the four ma targets, and to hopefully to demarket better the um, the Cenozoic sediments um, and the uh, bedrock uh, interface. So right now, um, well, previously we did do not have this information, mm -hmm. and we are using the uh, surface magnetic resonance to help us determine that. Yep. Yeah, Next. Okay. Well, I, I really flagged in my talk the value in knowing that we've got some of our groundwater samples coming from our basement, and ideally would love uh, ways of better uh, mapping and capturing that. But that is a tough uh, challenge, especially when you really rely on bore reports mm -hmm. or good stratigraphic holes. Um, uh, especially when you're in that area of cover and you're wanting to know are some of these bores hitting or screened in our basement areas. Um, 
something else that I think really builds on what Sarah was flagging is there's a real value in understanding the uh, hydrogeology to maybe get more from some of the anomalies that uh, I was bringing out. For example, if we know uh, and can constrain the groundwater flow in this region, then we can know whether an um, anomaly is like which direction is upflow, so which way we look for the um, deposit that could be sourcing that anomaly. Uh, and equally, if we have a better constraint on the recharge of the system, we can know uh, whether the groundwater has had time to uh, equilibrate with the host rock compositions. Um, we can, if we know the recharge area, we might um, be able to uh, try and account for the uh, change in the water chemistry as the water is kind of passed through the recharge zone, the regolith, um, which should uh, alter the, you know, produce different water rock interactions and uh, produce a different starting chemistry that would then be uh, evolved as it passed through the aquifer. So I think a lot more of these localised hydrogeological studies actually really would benefit this kind of mineral uh, approach to using groundwater too. Oh, great, thank you. This question is for KP from Richard Blewett. KP, fantastic work in outlining the mar potential for this uh, water dependent region. Obviously the community at Will Canyon will benefit from a secure water supply, but is there consideration of environmental flow management and or agricultural water security from such a scheme? Who will pay for the establishment of the pilot mar and or full blown project uh, mar if the pilot is successful? And can uh, an, an addition be made to economic fairways so ma versus equivalent dams be actually assessed at least financially wow there's a lot in that thanks richard um kp where would you like to start um, well, i'll start from the first question yep. um so basically yeah so to to fully develop into a ma project um it actually involves uh, four stages so from the preliminary assessment which is a desktop study to a um, assessment and investigation stage, which which is called a stage two, but basically it's like a proof of concept, and then to a um, a pilot scale um, setup of a system that that we can um, go through the whole process of injection and, and um, recovery to understand and what works and what doesn't work, um, and then see the viability and what risk is involved before um, it can be um, developed into a upscale into a full um, operational mm -hmm. mass scheme. So um, environmental flow is management is, or agricultural water um, basically would, would definitely be part of our, the points to consider um, because um, the, the aims of all these so-called risk assessments as part of the MA um, investigation of different stages is to protect the human health. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the the drinking water, um, Australian drinking water guidelines, and all we have to make sure that all the injected water, um, stored water, and the recovered water meets that, all the criteria, um, and also um, the environmental environmental flow. So that is basically um, we we'll probably have to set up um, limits as to when we can inject uh, water into the uh, storage aquifer. Um, that's during um, high river level flows. Um, and also, you know, when to when to uh, stop injecting water when the river level has uh, reached a certain um, low threshold that may um, impede on lowering the water water table, and thereby um, negatively impacting the um, groundwater dependent ecosystems mm -hmm. and the deep rooted vegetation within the riparian zones. Um, yeah, that that relies on the unconfined aquifer to survive. Mm -hmm. So certainly it's all part of the, the, the risk and hazards identification and mitigation. Um, so the second question is who will pay for the establishment of the pilot MA? Um, so basically we will be uh, working collaboratively with um, st stakeholders um, such as uh, New South Wales DQ and also the um, uh, National Water Grid Authority who is a proponent of um, MA schemes um, for community and environmental purposes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also the, the Murray Darling Basin Authority. And yeah, um, so then it depends on uh, what's the impetus and you know, who, who is going to um, support the pilot's MA scheme. And then and when everything is being um, uh, proven to be viable, then you know, 
who, who else would, would be take the, the responsibility on uh, to shoulder the, the full operational mark project. Uh, so oh, can I just add something yes, on that? Yeah, um, Richard, just about the economic fairways question. Um, for assessing the viability of MAR um, relative to suitability of MAR for relative to, say, a dam, um, there have been a number of MAR studies done already uh, across Australia, but um, we're in the Murray-Darling Basin, I guess. Um, and so those sorts of questions have been asked and um, areas that, would be more suitable. Um, so have the, the necessary prerequisites have, have been mapped. Um, those do believe a few uh, scientists use their COVID lockdowns to do desktop studies on this kind of thing. Um, so there's a few maps out there already. Um, and I know CSIRO is doing um, quite a big, bit of work in this space too. So I think that um, sort of first large scale assessment um, has has being done where the data is available, taking into account those factors of um, have you got a suitable water source? Have you know have you got a river with highly variable flows? Have you got a suitable mm. sort of storage aquifer? Is you know there a community that needs it? And and also some um, sums on the evaporative losses and and, and economics of, of running a mass scheme compared to a dam. So um, I can send you send you some of that uh, literature if you're interested. But um, it's definitely a space that a lot of work has been done already. All right, thanks. Sarah, I think we might stay with you for the next question from uh, Martin Smith. How much did the seismic line help in resolving structural and stratigraphic complexities? Uh, yeah, so um, the seismic line really did delineate um, between the, the sedimentary cover and the Paleozoic basement um, very clearly. Um, and you could see the um, accommodation space in the Burke Graben north of the Mount Oxley Fault Zone um, that uh, Trevor Mount um, identified a number of decades ago as a um, likely driver of that saline groundwater discharge into the Darling River. Um, so you could you could um, quite clearly see that accommodation zone in the Burke Graben and the sedimentary sequences there, um, and the generally fining upwards nature of um, the the valley fill, but. Um, the, I guess um, what was a shortcoming was we just didn't have enough um, drill hole constraint to differentiate between the Aramanga Basin sediments and the Cenozoic um, fill. So that's something that could be uh, done in future for sure. Yeah, great to add that to the wish list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right, a question for you, Yvonne, from Anthony Schofield. It's super exciting to see new anomalies not associated with recognised mineralisation. Are there any limitations on allant element mobility that could be used to provide constraints on the proximity of elevated groundwater measurements to potentially hidden mineralisation? Well, Anthony, thanks for the question. That's a really good question, really um, harks back to some of the um, caution that we need when trying to interpret groundwater chemistry from a minerals perspective, and that is that different uh, trace elements are going to have different mobility in our groundwater, and even that mobility can change depending on the um, uh, pH, the redox conditions of the groundwater. And so often what this means is uh, if there is an elemental anomaly, that's a really positive feature that you could be interested in. But if you're lacking that anomaly in any space, that doesn't mean there might not be something nearby, but we just don't have the groundwater conditions that have uh, mobilised uh, that metal or um, associated pathfinder elements to the degree you need. And this is kind of where isotopes are a really powerful tool because uh, at that point, you just require, um, if there is an isotope signature coming from mineralization, it really uh, resets and overtops the um, local groundwater composition, can spread quite a much further afield. You're not trying to figure out, is this actually higher above background or not? Uh, so I guess uh, if you have a good uh, ground uh, hydrogeological constraint in your groundwater system, uh, you can use the, uh, you can almost vector towards an anomaly by looking at, all right, our lead concentration might be, um, you know, high, really close to the deposit, um, but, you know, lead's very insoluble, we'd uh, drop that out of our groundwater quite quickly. So uh, you, you can use that to infer that maybe we're much closer, um, depending on the element in question. Yeah, exciting. Uh, so a question for UKP from David um, Schaefer. 
Uh, under the proposed MAR scheme, does the surface water first need to undergo riverbank infiltration, then be abstracted and then piped to a MAR target site for final injection infiltration? Are some losses of water expected during the riverbank infiltration process? Thanks, Cathy. Yep. Um, yes, certainly the, the river water would need to be treated first uh, before being injected into the uh, aquifer for storage. Um, however, the, the techniques that we choose um, could be, you know, um, a surface water, a surface water treatment technique um, by adding um, granulated active carbon um, to decompose all this uh, organic matter. But this will um, add a more sort of economic cost to it. So this um, bank filtration technique is going to uh, be more um, economically feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so in that way, um, yes, then you can sort of it's sort of a label technique that you can then inject the the water into the uh, into the storage aquifer. So, um, perhaps well, until we we do a trial pilot study test, we can't really quantify um, how much water can be lost during the process. Um, but I would expect that you know if there is, uh, it should be minimum. Uh, it's more because all the pipeline should be sealed. Um, you are just transferring water from from one place to the next, and the um, the water injection or water bank filtration wells are located where the there's already um, freshwater lands um, recharging from the Darling River um, beneath the floodplains, and you are just uh, injecting uh, sorry extracting it um, at a certain distance away from from the bank um, and send it send it across. So I think uh, in that case, there should be minimal um, losses of water. Yep. Okay, thank you. And another question for Sarah from Eamon Lay. Uh, given the time varying nature of recharge and discharge, what methods of data types or data types would you feel should be prioritised in understanding similar temporal dynamics in other study areas? Um, yeah, thanks Eamon, it's a good question. Um, so the uh, the methods and and data I, I mentioned um, in my in the first question I think um, are, are very widely applicable um, across the Murray Darling Basin and, and Cenozoic systems where um, we're looking at this high connectivity between ground and surface water systems. Um, so what what we ideally want is um, monitoring bores uh, with, with surface water gauges in close proximity to really um, be able to understand the connectivity between groundwater and surface water systems and how that varies through time. Um, we have already got uh, a monitoring bore network, um, but we, we could um, use, use data sets such as the, the AEM um, to prioritise where um, more, more monitoring would be useful. Um, I also alluded to um, the rate on hydrochemistry um, so there's, um, that is a really um, useful method for, for quantifying groundwater discharge into rivers. Um, and then there's the flip side of the coin is quantifying um, recharge in the aquifers. And there's a, um, a suite of um, hydrochemistry traces that we use for that. Um, and um, Anstow's just actually completed a, bit, a study um, using some of those across New South Wales. So um, we've got... A number of data sets I think we can capitalise on more um, but I guess uh, the, that's, the first step is quantifying those processes and the second is um, modelling what's likely to happen under future scenarios so um, we're likely to see those processes, um, the time frames that they're occurring changing um, and the groundwater levels changing so um, we've seen already in the Murray-Darling Basin a switch to um, more losing stream conditions as a result of groundwater levels declining. Um, so we're going to need to take those, um, that, those, that process understanding from those data sets and feed that into models um, which incorporate future, future rainfall scenarios to um, predict how they're going to change better into the future. And, and that's, that's something that's happening now, but um, modelling is definitely an area that we need a lot more um, resources put into uh, moving forward, yeah. Thank you. Another question for you, Sarah, from Anand. 
Uh, not to be biased, but that <laughs> is excellent correspondence of the uh, inverted AEM conductivity with the induction log. Uh, yep. Do you, would you like to comment? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, thanks, Anand. Um, I agree. I, I was very excited when I saw that um, incredible uh, correlation between those downhole logs um, and the, the AEM model in that area. Um, so that, you know, gives us really high confidence in how the AEM model is performing, um, especially since we had uh, groundwater chemistry data um, from from a couple of monitoring boards in that area. So, um, yeah, thanks thanks very much to the geophysical acquisition and processing team for developing such amazing um, inversion code um, and that we can use these, these AEM data sets. Um, and trust yeah. that they're right. Well, not necessarily right, but trust they're very accurate in that. Yeah, case, in that, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they confidence. did perform um, really, really well in that part of the study area. Yeah. Um, less so in the really conductive area in the north, and that's somewhere it would be good to try the probabilistic um, inversion code that um, GAP has developed because um, that has um, the capacity to resolve um, conductors a bit better mm. in that highly conductive um, feel. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be another thing on my wish list. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we're writing these down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, KP from Steve Lewis. Awesome job, KP. Great to see the value of integrating a variety of geoscience data sets to better understand MAR prospectivity. How does the work that you've done for the MAR study at Will Kenya apply to broader Australian context? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so basically we have demonstrated the integrated um, approach of using airborne EM, um, ground-based um, geophysics and also um, hydrochemistry and hydrodynamics data um, to apply this to um, the Cenozoic um, sediments. Um, so we can apply these techniques um, to other areas as well where we have got um, Cenozoic covers um, and where we also have um, shallow, for example, bedrock um, of uh, various Paleozoic um, age. Um, that's within uh, 400 meters of our detection limit of, what's the detection limit, but resolvable by the AEM. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, to apply this this technique in, in any of this um, region, uh, such as the the Murray Darling Basin, the uh, Lake Air uh, mm -hmm. basins, and also the upper part of the Great Artesian Basins. Um, and where we, in areas where we can identify the, the demand for water, and there's a, a source water available and also um, uh, proven adequate um, aquifers to store the water, then a uh, mass scheme um, prospectivity um, is, is probably present and then we can go through the, the four stages of a mass assessment to see um, whether this can be a viable project. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, a joint question for Sarah and KP from Anonymous. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sarah and KP, for your interesting talks, drawing diverse data together to make a cohesive story and understanding of groundwater de development potential. Given the nature of stream aquifer connection, I wonder whether you have considered recharge, as KP described, during high flows to intentionally reduce stream salinity in times of low flow, as well as enlarging the volume of low salinity groundwater supplies, as stated. This could be tested during a trial, such as KP proposed. Who wants to jump in on, on that one first? Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yes, I mean, uh, during, during floods, the, the river level is very high. Um, the, the groundwater salinity is, oh, sorry, the river salinity is low, but the salt load in the, in the river is high. Um, but we, we are considering, considering that the, this is uh, to have, to, to minimize the, the impacts on the unconfined aquifer so frankly speaking the um, it is only possible or should I say is more more likely that we can obtain enough water from the river um, for example if we if we need um, 100 200 megaliters per year of recharge then we need to um, get a license uh, for water allocation and to to inject this um, this water for for storage, so um, when so when you know when the the stream becomes um, too low mm. and you are getting base level um, discharge from the 
shafts from the, um, the groundwater, um, from the unconfined aquifer, and it becomes like, yeah, first of all, um, you are injecting perhaps brackish water or slightly higher um, salinity into, into the aquifer, and this is, this is not what we are trying to achieve. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so the intention of getting high flows to, uh, for, for groundwater injection is, is basically yes, to, to get the best uh, quality groundwater um, so that it can be, it still can be acceptable um, uh, after long, prolonged storage or eventual uh, use. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Sarah? Um, yeah, maybe I'll add, add something um, briefly. Um, yeah, I guess there's um, a number of number of reasons you might um, do uh, in, injection, deliberate um, recharge of aquifers, and, and KP was looking at um, Ma that. There are other reasons you might do it. You might do it to, um, as, as you mentioned, um, you could be trying to increase the, the freshwater storage in aquifer so that um, it can act as a um, bank return flow um, capacity. Uh, and I guess that's um, something that we, we don't make the decisions on, um, that prioritisation of where water is um, needed and where it's used um, throughout the, 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 the wider system is... Um, there's a lot of factors come in there, but um, it's definitely, um, as I understand, uh, something that's being considered um, to manage um, vulnerable ecosystems, for example, um, in some parts of the of the basin um, that are going to need some some sort of uh, assistance um, to survive the increased um, droughts and and declining groundwater levels. Um, but yeah not in the scope of this study that, that we've just done. Great. All right. Uh, Sarah, I'll stay with you. From Chris Jewell, shown on some of the GA sections, an apparent in multi-level monitoring bores at, for example, Union Bend, there is a shallow lens of saline groundwater above fresh water, fresher groundwater. How significant is downward leakage from this lens during drought under both emergency pump pumping from existing bores and potentially from freshwater recovery in Mar? Um, I'm not KP, you might, <laughs> it might be a better place to, to answer that, but um, we don't um, have the monitoring data to um, assess that at, at, at present. Um, we'd need salinity loggers and um, more um, more time series data. Um, so I think um, what K KP has, has talked about in, in terms of extra further further um, data sets would be required to assess um, that level um, of, of detail. Um, but maybe we can have a talk about this um, <laughs> post the post the showcase. Um, there's definitely a lot more detailed characterization of aquifers would need to be done um, if you were to use them for um, any extraction. Yeah, great. Well, Chris, then if you feel like we haven't, Sarah hasn't answered that question, you're welcome to email us at eftfga.gov.au and we can um, get that information to Sarah and you can um, continue the conversation. Um, so we'll draw the Q&A session to a close there. I'd like to thank Ivan, Sarah and KP. Uh, if you haven't had any of your questions, if any of your questions have been unanswered um, or you would like to connect to the speakers, as I said, uh, you can contact us at eftf.ga.gov.au. To conclude the final Exploring for the Future showcase, I'll now hand to Dr Carol Chinota, our Senior Science Advisor, to provide some reflections on the scientific achievements of the program and the dis discussions we've had over the last few days. Thank you, Carol. Wow. Thank you, Laura. I really appreciate that welcome. Wow. What a showcase. Um, the breadth, the depth of what we've heard over the last four days I think is amazing. And indeed, I think it's a reflection of the program as a whole over the last eight years. That's certainly the sentiment that I get when I speak to people externally and internally. There is a lot to digest. Uh, we know that we've kind of packed it all into these presentations. Um, the presentations are available uh, from the EFTF um, showcase website. Uh, the ones from today we posted in, in a little bit of time. And all the recordings are available on the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. Now, what I want to do is... I suppose cast your mind back to the very beginning of the showcase four days ago 
Um, at that time, um, the, uh, our minister, the Honourable Madeleine King, launched a, a publication, an overview of Australia's transformational geoscience program. It provided the highlights of the eight-year program, the achievements, and it's my pleasure now to release the accompanying technical report that goes with it. In that report, we go theme by theme and talk about the, each component of the program, why we did it, what was done within it, and what the outcomes so far have been. And importantly, it includes links to the over 1,000 different data sets and reports and publications that have come out from the program. I'll be going through these themes, and as I go through them, I want to pose the question, what was it that was so transformational about the program? That's a big word. It's a big claim. So that's what I want to do in the next few minutes. So starting off with the regional projects, which is the theme of today's uh, showcase, what was transformational about them? Geoscience Australia has been undertaking these regional projects for decades. I've been here for over 20 years and I've seen many of them and a lot of them have success uh, for, for decades to come. But I've never seen the amount of stimulation of industry exploration as we've seen during the Exploring for the Future program. So something has been special about it. So what is it? I've been reflecting on that question for quite some time. And I think that the Exploring for the Future program came at just the right time. We were armed with the Uncover map, uh, a roadmap, which identified for the minerals industry what to do. Uh, we were building up basin inventories to work out where the knowledge gaps were. And the momentum on the application of airborne electromagnetics for groundwater studies was building in the Geoscience Australia regional projects. But what the Exploring for the Future did more importantly is it allowed us the opportunity to be bold and to be more considered in the way that we roll out the science that we do. If you have a look at this slide here, just have a look at what this region between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa looks like. A large part of it is covered by the Barclay Tablelands. This is a flat plain. How do you explore through an area like that? Which part of it do you start? We picked an area almost the size of the United Kingdom. Like, how do you, how do you locate yourself within that? The thing that the Exploring for the Future program did is we first acquired the big scale data sets across the whole region, then we interpreted and then we found the next successive area to focus on and we collected the data sets in that. And then we zoomed in again and importantly, we tested it with drilling. We did this using reflection seismic profiles and drilling stratigraphic holes. We did it using electrical methods, um, MT, uh, OS AEM, and zooming in uh, through that approach. And we've seen that the way that we started four years ago, we've continued through the regional project that we've heard about today. That is, across the Delamarian region, the Birindudu, the Upper Darling, the Musgraves, and so on. Importantly, we've also been thinking about what are the best data sets to collect that provide, that sense the information that we are after. We heard today from KP and Sarah the importance of the surface magnetic resonance technique. The probabilities that you saw within that were actually part of an internal innovation project, where we, instead of just having one solution, we've been able to combine fundamental nuclear physics, AEM and data science to have a capability that no one previously has had. And I think it's this sort of deep level of subject matter expertise that has, um, that has made the regional project such a great success. But we didn't just stay within the regional projects. Exploring for the Future gave us a license to initially collect data across Northern Australia and then the entire country. This is where big data acquisition programs such as AusAM, AusLamp, AusArray happened. But including the isotopic atlas, the heavy mineral maps, um, uh, the, the interpretations of the geology and the like. Now, that's, uh, that data acquisition, a lot of science is said that it's 1% inspiration and it's 99% perspiration. There was a lot of perspiration in this. There's a lot of effort. It's a huge logistical task. We heard from Margie the advancements that we've been making in terms of 
connecting with the landholders and explaining what we are doing, how are we going about, how are, how are we going about it. Importantly, it's also not just a click and collect exercise. You have to have deep domain expertise within that. So when we bring in that information, we, are, we transform it into useful data products. And during the Exploring for the Future, our national coverages of individual data sets have expanded significantly. You heard from Phil how machine learning and AI is being used to come up with new maps of the surface of elemental concentrations. You've heard from Anand how we've pushed the frontiers of airborne electromagnetics inversions by embracing uncertainty, making the images crisper, yet providing us more information. From Mark Hoggard, you heard about the strategic eight-year process of going from conceptual models of the lithosphere to actually mapping the, the lithosphere sinosphere boundary. We went from experiments on individual crystals to calibrate equations, how to work out the depth and the temperature that these crystals have come from, through and that was at the ANU, then through calibrations with Harvard, Imperial and Oxford, how do you convert from velocities to temperatures to come up with these maps? And that's just one of the maps that is shown on this slide. The amount of effort to come up with each one of these is astonishing. Importantly, we're not just sensing the geophysics or the geochemistry. We've made a huge step forward in understanding Australia's geology itself. The release during this showcase of the layered geology map by Andrew Heap and then going through it by Guillaume is a major step forward. I don't know of any other continent that has this type of coverage and it's now coupled with the work that we've been doing of working out what are the sedimentary basins across Australia. What is their 3D distribution? What are the stratigraphic correlations? This is a huge step forward for groundwater, as we heard from Nadej, and the robustness that we heard from uh, Seb in terms of collecting this type of information. That is, this is curated. Uh, these are curated data sets. The Exploring for the Future program has also allowed us to take all these data sets and put them together. But we're not just slapping them together. It's done in a very considered way. We heard from Ariane the statistical tests that have, been put, uh, that have been given to the mineral potential maps. We heard about the sampling of mine waste to put more and more quantitative information into the mine waste atlas. We heard from uh, uh, Andrew Feitz and others uh, about, the, uh, about the salt uh, that, uh, uh, that we're mapping across the country. Um, uh, to, to, to look at hydrogen storage. Importantly, behind each one of these data sets, we're not just going to the literature, we're testing the literature to see whether it makes sense. Whether the maps that we're providing are the, ro as robust as they can be. We heard from Eric, the first geomechanical study of hydrogen injection into a depleted gas field. We're testing, effectively, what is the best way to store these resources. We heard from Ariane, the first release of the iron oxide copper gold model. But that is built on decades of work, including during the Exploring for the Future program, of working out what are the processes that concentrate the elements to form mineral deposits. And that knowledge itself is useful, that conceptual understanding of the zonations of minerals and the tectonic environments within which they form. And it was great to hear from BHP a couple of years ago that this contributed to their um, exploration and discovery of Oak Dam. Last, we make all of this information publicly available. When we were consulting with industry at the beginning of the program, the thing that we heard time and time again is make your information readily available as fast as you can. So we have tried to shorten the period of time from data collection to data delivery. We deliver raw information, processed information, then interpretations, then combinations in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the mineral potential, uh, energy potential and groundwater implications of our work. Now a lot of this work and a lot of the data sets that we provide, uh, the target audience is subject matter experts which use it and inform their studies. Now, if I can take a moment aside, is uh, during this program, I took a secondment up to northeast Arnhem Land and had the privilege of working with the Dimaru Rangers. There, I shared the data sets that Geoscience Australia has, and we talked through what are the implications for resources across their regions. And their comment was, 
Well, that's great, you know this, but we would like to know the implications of this also. And that's a similar comment that we get from lots of areas. So with the launch of Geo Insight by Catherine Walterberg, we've begun that journey of trying to provide plain language summaries of the implications of the work that we have provided so that the public good of the, of the geoscience that we collect here can be expanded. Now, that brings me to the end. Um, but I dare say that exploring for the future is just the beginning. So to have the final word on the program and to introduce what's coming next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Andrew Heap, our Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Carol. Yes, these final thoughts mark the conclusion of the Exploring for the Future program. Definitely a historic milestone in Geoscience Australia's history. This year's showcase demonstrates that the Exploring for the Future program has been a, a resounding success. Immediately prior to me, you heard from our science science advisor, Carole, about the amazing world-leading science advancements that have come out of the program. But beyond the science advances, then there's also been a positive outcomes for other stakeholders as well. For explorers and resource developers, the Exploring for the Future program has narrowed the search area and lowered the technical risks of resource exploration in frontier regions. For investors, it's provided information on resource opportunities, increasing Australia's attractiveness as an investment destination. For governments, it's informed resource and land management decisions. And for First Nations peoples and regional Australians, it has provided important information about their lands and waters. We have succeeded in realising the outcomes for the program. However, there is still much more to do. As I highlighted in my introductory presentation to the showcase, the global environment continues to exert its influence. Many of the challenges we face at the start of the Exploring for the Future program are still with us. Resource supply chains are under pressure, with increasing fragmentation and intensification of global competition, and a trend towards nationalism. New opportunities in clean energy industries continue to develop that will shape the future of the global economy over the next decade and beyond. Australia is poised to play a leading role, and, understand, and understanding Australia's resource potential has never been more crucial. Our country's abundant supply of minerals, including critical minerals and strategic materials, and the adoption of low emissions technologies such as carbon capture and storage and hydrogen will be instrumental in achieving long-term sustainability. These vital national assets hold the key to our goals of driving economic growth, creating jobs, supporting infrastructure projects, and contributing to the development of co communities across our nation. These goals cannot be achieved without securing and responsibly managing Australia's precious groundwater, which underpins ecosystems, communities and industries, and provides the foundation to enable economic progress. As we saw with the release of the Australian Government's Science Statement and Research Priorities this week, the role of science, especially geoscience, has never been more essential to paving the way for a brighter, more prosperous future for Australia. In that light, and building on the success of the Exploring for the Future program, the Australian Government has invested $3.4 billion over the next 35 years for the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity, a landmark initiative to be led by Geoscience Australia. This generational investment in pre-competitive geoscience is set to, so, set to accelerate the discovery of critical minerals and strategic materials and other resources necessary for the net zero transition, cementing our nation's position as a global renewable energy leader. Resourcing Australia's prosperity underscores the Australian Government's strategy to put the resources industry at the heart of its future Made in Australia plan, to maximise the economic and industrial benefits of the move to net zero and securing Australia's place in a changing global economic and political landscape. With cutting-edge geoscience and a collaborative approach, we will uncover the hidden potential of our vast continent, ensuring a brighter future for generations to come. Resourcing Australia's prosperity is an ambitious endeavour that will see us use our collective skills, data, research and analysis to assess the national potential for a broad suite of resources. The resources critical to the net zero transition, as well as groundwater and environmental, social and governance risk factors for resource exploration and development. It represents a long-term investment in our people and technology. And our decades of experience and expertise in providing geoscientific data and knowledge on Australia's
natural resources. By 2060, we will have delivered mineral potential maps for 36 of Australia's critical minerals and strategic materials and completed national coverages of key data sets. We will have completed deep dive studies for at least 12 onshore regions and we will have completed detailed inventories for all of Australia's groundwater systems. And we will have unlocked and modernised valuable archives of offshore legacy data to support assessment of CO2 storage potential and identification of suitable sites for offshore wind power. Resourcing Australia's prosperity will provide new science, data and tools to support informed decision making by government, industry and communities. We will be reaching out to you very soon to get feedback on the design and delivery of the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity program. Please visit our website for more details about how to get involved. The need for a continued pathway for strong and ongoing economic growth for Australia has never been greater and Resourcing Australia's Prosperity will play a pivotal role in charting that course. But for now, we can say the Exploring for the Future program has laid the foundation for this ambitious, ambitious journey, paving the way for a prosperous and sustainable Australia. Thank you to everyone who has contributed to the success of the Exploring for the Future program. I acknowledge and am grateful for the ongoing support of our partners and our stakeholders. It's been fantastic to have you join us for this, our last Exploring for the Future showcase. Our geoscientific work empowers you our stakeholders across government, community, academia and industry to make informed decisions and drive positive change for our nation. I'm so proud of our achievements and I look forward to stepping into the future together as we continue to maximise the benefits for Earth's, of Earth science for all Australians. Exploring for the Future stands now in our history books, an outstanding success and monumental achievement. As we look towards resourcing Australia's prosperity, we can definitely say that we have explored for Australia's future.